Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's the 21st of February, and our special guest's phone is ringing. His name is Maurice Gibbons, and he is the author of the Self-Directed Learning Handbook. Maurice, thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure, Steve. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. Thanks to Mighty Bell and Blackboard Collaborate for their support. Coming up this year, we have some really, really fun uh, worldwide virtual conferences. These are all free events. Uh, they start March 28th with the School Leadership Summit. They're built around peer-to-peer -peer learning. And so these are school leaders teaching each other. There's still time to submit a proposal if you're interested. That's at schoolleadershipsummit.com. At ISTE, we're doing some really fun stuff for the seventh year. We call it ISTE Unplugged. It's all crowdsourced activities. And it starts the Saturday before with Hack Education, an all-day unconference that Audrey Waters is going to help facilitate this year. Then coming up in July is the Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Worldwide Conference, uh, which will be at stemxcon.com. It's not up yet. And then for the third year, our Library 2.013, the Future of Libraries virtual conference, thanks to San Jose State University. Uh, recently heard this referred to as the biggest, best known conference in the library world. Uh, that's a huge credit to all of you who've participated in that. Plus then the Global Education Conference in November, uh, our mothership, five days, 24 hours a day, 400 to 500 sessions, again, all teachers, students, teaching each other. Coming up on the future of education tomorrow, Michael Fullen on education reform and the change process. Monday, Richard Millington at an early hour. Also, Michael's at an early hour as well, so check at futureofeducation.com for that. Richard Millington on social community management. Gavin Dykes on Tuesday on student voice. Roger Shank on cognitive science and learning on Thursday. Then into March, we've got lots of fun. You can see new on this list, uh, Peter Gray on Free to Learn, Elliot Washer on Leaving to Learn, uh, Ernie Turner and Simona David on Improving Schools One Community at a Time, a fascinating project taking place in Romania, and Will Richardson to come on and talk about his uh, short book, Why School. Anyway, lots coming up. Hope you'll join us for one. If you've missed any shows, they are all recorded. A fascinating show with Alan November this week. Before him, Laura Grace Walden on Free Range Learning, Carol Black on Occupy Your Brain, Stephen Bezruchka on Poverty and Education. Um, anyway, lots coming up. Uh, these are all recorded in full Blackboard Collaborate form and an MP3, and they are available for your listening pleasure. So this is the chance where our live studio audience gets to indicate where they're participating from. Look for the star to the left of the map, double click on it, and then click on the map. Give a shout out in the chat. Let us know the time, the temperature, your mood, <laughs> whatever you want to tell us. And you know what I'll do here, Gail, is I'm going to turn my audio down just a bit. You can turn your audio up, and it should be that, that Maurice and I match. I'm reluctant to tell anybody that I'm actually on the island of Maui right now. I wish it were a vacation, but I am working. Uh, however, I am headed to New Zealand and Australia in the next month, so I'm anxious to return to Australia in my first time in New Zealand. Please, please keep putting your information in the chat. We're going to move forward here. There is a Mighty Bell space for this show. Mighty Bell is the content curation a service that Gina Bianchini has started. She was the co-founder of Ning. I really like Gina. I do consulting work for her, so there's full disclosure there. But if you want to keep the conversation going about self-directed learning and Maurice's work, you can go into that Mighty Bell space. It's also listed on the futureofeducation.com blog post for tonight's show. So Maurice, um, we had an experience in, um, I do a, a weekly podcast with Audrey Waters called Hack Education, and we had an experience a couple of months ago that was sort of 
it was very moving and also sort of transformative of our thinking about education. And it was a description of her son who had just graduated from high school and his complete inability to feel like he could direct his own life. And she was open about this with his permission. And uh, we started asking this question question, do most students graduate from secondary or high school with a sense of being self-directed? And unfortunately, I think the answer is no, isn't it? Uh, I believe so. Um, I remember when my son graduated, um, a group of about 16 of his friends gathered in the living room, and my son asked me to come in, and he said, uh, Dad? Uh, all of us have just graduated from school, and we have the faintest idea what to do next. And so we sat for most of the afternoon and talked about what to do next. And uh, they were very confused. They had never thought uh, about what was going to come next. I'm sure some of them had, but they didn't have plans. And you know, a lot of them took a long time to find their way. So you were sort of thinking about this when, if I got the history correct, you watched this movie called Walkabout. Can you describe that experience? Well, uh, it wasn't the, the walkabout was like the inciting incident. It wasn't the formative incident um, of, in, in the sense it gave me the metaphor I needed. It wasn't, it didn't give me the idea. Um, the idea started when I was a kid. Um, my, we were we were quite poor, and um, my mother um, was uh, scrubbing floors uh, in the quite rich area nearby, and um, they had troubled children. So they asked. Uh, she said, "Well, my son's pretty good with kids. Why don't you let him work with them?" So I, I worked with a number of young kids, and they were all troubled. Um, they had everything, but they were all troubled. And they didn't seem to have any sense of themselves or where they were going. And then I worked for the YMCA and uh, did a lot of consulting uh, with, uh, with kids, a lot of work with uh, teens and things like that. And I just got a real sense of, about kids. Uh, I worked a lot on um, teaching. I just worked a lot on, um, with young people who were in the troubled areas of town. So I got a real insight into the struggles kids were going through and the trouble they were having in becoming people, really. Um, they didn't seem to have a sense of direction or a sense of morality or a sense of what was interesting or what they wanted to do, and they didn't have ideas, which I thought was kind of scary. So I, um, when I got to teaching, I started to think, well, well, what is it that kids need that they're not getting? And it seemed to me that they were not getting the kind of experience that caused them to turn inward and find out who they were by what they were doing, uh, or to find out what they, who they were and then to do things that develop that. Uh, so I s started to think about, and I started uh, as a teacher, I started to experiment with ways that I could get kids involved. And we had kids on a on a, a, a creative weekend where we where they they planned the program. Uh, this is the high school kids. Uh, they planned the program, and it was all based on the idea of being creative and imaginative. So they uh, hired, they said what they wanted speakers on and that sort of thing. And they were the usual things. They wanted one on philosophy and sex and uh, on um, developing a career and um, um, being a good person and uh, things like that. I was very impressed, and I found people who were willing to do that, and the conversations that followed were sensational. Uh, and it moved me very deeply because the, the kids were very authentic when they weren't, uh, when they were in charge, and the teachers who sat in on all the groups were, were not in charge. They were just, they were members and participants. And at the end, um, in the evaluations, which were all very good um, and very thoughtful, one person said, uh, this is the greatest weekend that I have ever been on, and it, uh, and it was a weekend in which um, um, my teacher, I, my, my friends became my teachers became my friends, and my friends became my teachers. And I thought, well, that's that's pretty much a theme that I'd like to like to develop. Um, 
And so when I did get, uh, went on and started doing my graduate work and um, later uh, started uh, teaching uh, at the university, I, I started doing research and work in this area. And it was then uh, that I started to think, oh, right, what, you know, how can I create a program around which will provide children, provide young people with the um, opportunity and the focus to develop their own direction? and their own responsibility, and their own personality, and their own uh, vision. Um, and then I, uh, uh, that, that's when I, uh, I thought of, I saw the movie, and the movie just clicked. I thought, wow, here is a, a test that is perfectly designed for those people. I've been in Australia. I'd seen the, the Aboriginal people and uh, talked with some of them. And I understood what they had tried to do. And when I saw the movie and saw that the, the children going out of the outback in their little private school outfits carrying their briefcases and being totally lost and unable to survive, and here comes an Aboriginal boy who's perfectly adapted to this circumstance and saves their lives. Um, and I thought, so here is a primitive culture that has found a way, a perfect test, for their young people, he was about 16, and he's out um, and perfectly equipped and able to feed himself, find water, find his direction, and uh, get, make his way home. And if he can't get home, well, he can't, you know, he can't be much use to the tribe anyway. So this is a survival thing, and you can imagine the preparation that the tribe gives that young man or young man before he goes out into the outback. So I thought, this is, this is a perfect training for that situation. And it occurred to me, what would be an equally perfect situation for our uh, uh, youth in, graduate, in graduating? And that's when I got the idea. That's, that's what gave the for, a formative nature to those ideas that I had. In addition to the three-day retreats that were planned by the students, you also mentioned uh, drama and um, this how to become an expert program for middle school students. Yes. I'm particularly interested in the drama piece because it seems like that's been a thread through some of our interviews that people whose voices are making a difference right now, like Ken Robinson, and you have a drama background. What's the tie there? Well. It is that in order to present a character, you have to understand the character. And so it, understanding this character gives you also an opportunity to explore yourself and to try on personalities. So, you know, if you're, uh, if you're a character in uh, Riders to the Sea, um, you know, you have to get into the character who has lost his, her, her whole family um, on the sea. And um, uh, they're fishermen, you know, in Kurax and the storms. They, if, if you've been to the Aran Islands, you see it's just, just, you know, grave after grave. And this is here lies the, the, the young men from this family who died at sea at this age. And um, if you have to get into that kind of person, you really start to understand yourself. Uh, in order to present that person, you have to touch something of incredible sadness in yourself in order to express that sadness on stage. And that, I think, is, is one of those things. You start to become confident. And then, of course, you're presenting. You're on stage. You're taking a terrific risk. And I, I think that capacity to take a risk is very important to growth. And we don't have nearly enough opportunity for it. Not legitimate risk, anyway. We create risks, but they're, they're not true risks, and everybody knows that. So what's the difference between student-directed learning and teacher-directed learning? Well, where to start? <laughs> um, um, let's, just, let's just do the, the, the raw picture. In teacher-directed learning, the teacher selects everything. They select the, uh, the goals. They select the content. They select the, um, the um, 
meetings presentation and direct the means of learning. They evaluate the student's progress and um, are just in complete control of the learning experience. Well, in self-directed learning, that's all reversed. The student sets the goals. The student um, uh, uh, decides how, how uh, he or she will learn it. And they decide on the process that they will use. And they evaluate uh, their own progress, because that's an important part of learning. Uh, and um, uh, and so the, if you can imagine that, the, the role of the teacher in, the, in between them, on the one hand, is directing uh, the content and directing the student, marching the student through that content, whereas on the other side, the, the teacher has to ask, how can I help the student to, 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 find, uh, to find his own direction, his own nature, his own style, and his own direction, and then to follow it efficiently and effectively. And uh, so that means that on the one hand, you're teaching content, on the other hand, you're teaching process. And, you know, I just, I think that seems to me to be the future, and especially now with the uh, resources available to students, there's really no reason why a student shouldn't be able to give him or herself a degree. You talk about the difference between necessary processes and assigned content. What do you mean by a necessary process? Okay, well, listen, if you're um, uh, assigned content, of course, is where today we're going to discover the, the, the history of uh, German. Um, assigned processes, today we're learning, going to learn how to set goals, how to set your own goals for yourself. That's process. And then the sort of everything that follows from that, learning how to plan, learning how to uh, set up a, the action, how to take action. You see, the center of self-directed learning is action. It's taking action. It's not content. It's not, uh, it's not just content for its own sake. It is content related to action. It was interesting to me that you took several sort of current research trends constructivism, social learning, motivation, and you, you looked at them from the standpoint of how, they, how we talk about them in teacher-directed learning. And then you ask us as the readers to, to rethink what that means in, in terms of self-directed or student-directed learning. That, that's true. Um, I think one of the most interesting things is a recent book by um, Bowmeister and Turney called Willpower. And they're discussing the whole idea of um, self-control, self-management, uh, which is, you know, the essence of self-direction. And they're saying that it is the only reliable um, trait, human trait, for predicting success in the future. Uh, so um, uh, this is, I'm sorry. Um, and so this is the, um, this is, these are the, the kinds of trends that are just being uh, strangely misinterpreted in my view. Um, I think the tendency, for instance, take personalized learning. Now that sounds like self-direction, doesn't it? But it's not. Uh, what it is is more sensitive responsiveness to students so they more effectively absorb the content. And, you know, uh, it's the same with, I remember starting uh, in early when I was doing my doctoral work, I had to study individualized instruction, which was the current uh, way. But I found that, uh, you know, that the self-direction, self -direct, that, uh, in, that um, independent learning, uh, individualized instruction, where it occurred, it was like maybe uh, a period on Friday. Uh, it wasn't uh, wasn't a school tendency, and then it was often uh, self. Uh, it was often um, individualized instruction, of course, in learning the unit. So I thought that was kind of interesting, and uh, I think that's what happens very often is that we hear about trends that are moving that sound as if they've been socialized or. Uh, are, 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 are interpreting the, the, the current research and uh, uh, educational trends and moving in the direction of more, um, of more, uh, more social, more 
personal learning, more uh, learning that, that is, uh, you would think, more self-directed. When I hear personalized, I say, okay, maybe they're moving towards self-direction. But when I look into it, no, that's not really it. Because self-direction starts with us, right at the core of who we are. If, you, if you're going to start self-directed learning, learning that's going to come from the individual, uh, it is a completely different idea because now you become an associate of the individual. You're helping that person to discover the very essence of themselves, um, their strengths, um, their, their ideas, their imagination, the range of their ability. Um, you're encouraging them to develop human characteristics that it is the natural way to develop character because in being self-directed, it requires courage, termination, uh, perseverance, um, insight, creativity, imagination. I mean, it is the essence of um, training for character. And um, uh, you have to have character for self-direction. Um, um, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to continue because the essence of it is ch personal challenge. You progress by challenging yourself to move forward, and that's the essence of self-management, too. I can just sort of ramble Peggy on. Peggy George asked a question in the, the, No, no, that's good. Peggy George asked a question in the chat that I, that I wonder if it's instructive. She says, is self-discipline the same as self-control? And she may have meant is self-direction the same as self-control. But it is interesting how self-discipline and self-control are phrases that kind of have a connotation of some, meeting somebody else's expectations on your behavior, whereas self-direction seems to be much more about setting your own path forward. Well, there's a, here's a very interesting study that was done uh, uh, um, uh, on self-regulation. Uh, 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 a study was done uh, offering four-year-olds uh, a marshmallow, and if they if they didn't eat the marshmallow for 15 minutes, they got another marshmallow. Well, a portion of them gobbled the marshmallow right away, a significant portion of them. Another portion waited, waited, but just couldn't resist. Finally, gobbled it before the 15 minutes was up, and then a group uh, a group didn't, and collected their second. Um, marshmallow. Well, the researcher uh, was uh, living on the university campus, and so he had, through his own children going to school, he had some contact with these same students who were in the study. And he started to realize that there were an association between characteristics uh, that they were developing and exhibiting and what they had done with the marshmallow. Those who gobbled the marshmallow right away were troublemakers. And um, this continued throughout life, and he fought, did follow-up studies, and uh, it showed that uh, that these people who, who lack self-control and self-management are um, uh, are going to have uh, going to be poorer uh, performers in education. Uh, they're going to have a higher likelihood of criminal record, and so on. So, what we're talking about when we're talking about these issues is the ability to direct oneself, the ability to manage one's uh, one's behavior, uh, to the, it becomes very vivid in the marshmallow test. Are you familiar with the follow-up test that was done? Uh, you're going to love this, because this was Bandura and Michelle, I think, at Stanford, uh, and in a second set of tests, they actually trained students to have more self-control. And the students that they gave the training to had the same long-term outcomes as those who had shown it prior to the training. That's fabulous. Will you email me that reference? I will. It's, uh, it is really fun uh, to hear that second part. Um, OK, so you talk about students gradually taking over the teaching operations. That's going to hit some people by surprise, right? Um, I think it's disturbing, um, uh, and I think it's why it's so, it's so strong and resisted, I think, in, you know, in, in, in uh, regular education circles. Uh, and, and I understand that, uh, because it means quite a significant change in role, 
um, also, we, you know, the sort of basic idea of discipline is having children being obedient and the class an orderly class, uh, uh, <laughs> even teenagers. Um, and in self-direction, there's a lot more action. You know, there's people moving around, there's people in groups discussing and talking. There are people, there has to be some flexibility in moving in and out of the school um, and those kinds of things. Um, so uh, it is a major change and it means learning a whole new set of skills as well. For instance, I think the main, one of the main teaching uh, skills um, is still teaching, but the other part of it is uh, conferencing meeting with students and being able to discuss with them in a way that is nurturing to the development of their own ideas. And that is a, that's, that's a, that's a skill that, that, uh, that really needs to be developed in order to be successful in this realm. I hear a lot about whole child learning and or whole student learning. And I'm wondering if your sort of focus on the self-reflective piece, the self-awareness and the metacognition, which I think is very closely aligned with your journaling recommendation. Is that what people mean when they talk about whole student, looking at the whole student? Um, you know, there's, within any of these um, concepts, there's a range of actual practice. And uh, I've seen the same kind of range of, of practice here. And, you know, to be honest, I'm not quite sure that I have ever seen a classroom that claims to be um, based on the whole child concept. Presumably, uh, every teacher would say, I would certainly, even when I was teaching English, I would say, yeah, I, I could, yeah I'm a whole child teacher uh, because I cared about my kids, and, you know, and that sort of thing. But um, uh, I don't think that implicit in the idea of the whole child uh, is necessarily self-directed learning. But like, you're, you, there is a theme throughout the book of this sense of this not just being intellectual, but also being emotional and a part of the, the growth of an individual, the personal growth of an individual. Well, if you, uh, if you look at somebody like Eric Erickson, who I think is still highly regarded, his, um, uh, his theory of development was that we move from stage to stage. I mean, that's, that's implicit in our development uh, through life and the, the stages of life. And uh, one, for instance, is the stage of uh, adolescence when we have to develop um, an identity or uh, experience role confusion. And if we don't adult, develop an identity, we remain in role confusion and until, until we achieve that, if we ever do. So there are challenges uh, at each level of uh, life. Uh, and I, I believe strongly in, uh, in that idea that, uh, that we have to learn to move forward and to move forward on a regular basis and to move forward well. Uh, and that continues throughout life. That's my concern, is the inconsistency with the way people are in school, with the way they're going to be the rest of their lives. I think people should be learning to be self-directed like they are in kindergarten, or they used to be in kindergarten. I haven't been in one for a while, but they used to be very, very self-directed and, um, uh, and full of action and uh, activities and explorations and discoveries. And um, it seems to me that's, that's the way school should be. It should, we should be learning every day something we can use well for the rest of our lives. In fact, the system should be designed to promote successful life. And uh, that's why I believe in self-directed learning is because I think it cultivates who we are, it cultivates uh, our skills and abilities, and it gives us, uh, encourages us to develop uh, uh, a sense of what we can do well and becoming expert in, in some field of our choice uh, and uh, growing up to be whole and developing human beings. Um, it is a very emotional activity. Uh, it involves uh, qualities of character that are very emotionally based, like, as I mentioned, courage, uh, decisiveness, uh, perseverance, and, and so on. 
which are great qualities and qualities that not only enable us to resist uh, gobbling our, our marsh, first marshmallow in order to get two, uh, but also enable us to keep going even as we get older to pursue um, a, a, a wider and a deeper quality of life. So I want to move to a discussion of implementation because I think many people here will be interested in that. But before I do so, you do talk in the book about uh, the role of passion and finding passions. Where do you land on this spectrum of um, sort of an inborn passion versus becoming good at something and having that become a passion because you're good at it? Um, I say yes and yes. Um, some people seem to have that natural drive. I don't know whether it comes from the family environment or what. I, I suspect we are really tabula rasa when we're born, um, uh, except we have some inclinations that are of a general nature through our DNA. But um, uh, it doesn't really matter, uh, it, it, because if you have that, it, let's imagine that you do come with an imprint. Um, then uh, it should be developed. Uh, you should discover it. Find out about it as soon as you can and start honing and developing it. But my sense is that uh, people move from thing to thing, and that's okay. You know, I, I want to, uh, it's like clubs. I, I do a lot of things, and I do some professionally for, for my, you know, for my salaries, and um, I do some just because I love to do them. Uh, and when I'm really lucky, what I do for work is also what I love to do. Uh, and uh, that seems to me to be the way to go, is to seek those things to do that give you great pleasure, provide you with skill, and enable you to make a contribution. I, I think we, I'm sorry. Can I just develop that for a second? Because I, I think... Uh, absolutely. Really, thanks. <laughs> I, I think there are really four things. I, you know, I, the existentialists um, were, when I was a young man, existentialism kind of um, hit me broadside, and uh, with their sense that life is meaningless um, uh, because we're born to die, uh, and in a generation or two are forgotten even by family. Uh, so how do you give that strange thing, this brief thing, this spark in a great universal timeline um, of life that we have, how do you give it meaning? And um, it seems to me that this is a, this is as deep as that, um, that that we learn to give life meaning by finding out who we are and can be, by finding out what we can do and what we will do, by extending uh, the number and quality of relationships we have with others, and by making a difference in the world. And by that I mean that can be done by helping, you know, by, by a small service, or it can be done by, uh, by literally changing the world and feeding the hungry. And I, I think that we're, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about people forming their lives, and it is a full-time job. Uh, and uh, and it only a small portion of that is the work we will do. But um, uh, discovering who we are from whatever source, uh, or who we can is more uh, and the more important part of that is who we can be, and that's always a possibility in the future, not a certainty. I'm struck by the degree to which, in order to go down this path, you need a caring adult who actually knows this path. I mean, that's sort of self-evident, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. I um, I, I believe that. Uh, that uh, self-directed learning is a quality for the teacher as well as for the student, because for the teacher, they'll be finding a center in him or herself that is calm and assuring, and that enables them to look outside themselves and see each student as a forming individual who needs uh, the opportunity and the assistance to find out who they are and who they will be. So do teachers who begin to implement student-directed learning find that there is a pattern to the amount of effort and work that's involved? 
does it start out with more work required and then end up being more sort of peaceful? Is there a way to describe the path? Well, uh, one way is to look at uh, a place where um, where uh, self-directed learning is uh, is established, and uh, that would be Jefferson County Open in um, Colorado. Um, I haven't checked with them recently, but for years they have been um, a, um, a lighthouse for uh, this practice and um, uh, took the ideas and made them their own and developed them in a way that has had really quite a profound effect uh, uh, on, a num on all the, on all, a, a num uh, I was going to say all their students, but uh, that of course isn't likely true, um, but it's certainly a very, very large percentage of them. There's a book about it, uh, Lives of Passion, Schools of Hope. That was an interview of uh, eight or 900 students who graduated from the school and, uh, and uh, studied their, their responses to the experience they had and the quality of life that resulted. It's, 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 quite, it's quite impressive. I love this line from the book. Go ahead if you need to. Maybe that was me coming back to the speakers. I love this line in the book. A curriculum can be defined in a list of the competencies students are expected to perform. Yeah. Yes, I, I think I, I, that's entirely possible. We, uh, in fact, uh, I think I think some teachers, although I, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't. I haven't been close to schools uh, for a while, so you know this is. Uh, I, I have to admit that, and I'm not able to speak directly about this. But um, when we were, when I was de developing curriculum and uh, working with uh, with schools, and indeed in myself, uh, taught was teaching myself. We often used a list of competencies that students would develop, and then would uh, provide opportunities for the students to, to develop those and encourage them in their achievement. So there's the general ideas of the book around self-directed learning, but there's also there are also some very sort of specific opportunities or recommendations for implementing. Can you tell us what a learning package is, what a personal plan is, what triads are, and what passages are? Sure. <laughs> well, uh, let's see. What was the first one? Well, you can take them in any order, but I had written down, uh, you know, learning packages. Okay, and then give me the list again. I wasn't really clear. Okay, the learning packages, personal plans, uh, the peer support groups or triads, uh, passages, student learning agreements, celebrations. This, there's kind of a structure here. Yeah. Well, the package is, um, can you imagine a, a spectrum from the teacher-directed learning I described to the self-directed learning? If you imagine a spectrum of those, where on one hand we have a strictly teacher-directed everything by the textbook, by the test, by the lesson, uh, and the questions afterwards. Now, if we move away from that, um, we can start to, we can move in degrees toward a, the other side where the student is starting to, is deciding the goals he or she is going to pursue and um, how he or she will pursue them. So um, one way in the spectrum of moving between those is to say, all right, um, we're going to still teach the content that you want taught, but we're not going to have lessons with a teacher standing in front. We'll create a package, uh, for instance, uh, at um, one of the local high schools is self-directed. Uh, they have, uh, they use this approach. I call it the self-managed approach, in which you're still doing the curriculum, but you're doing it in a, a, a personal and self-managed way uh, with uh, at regular opportunities to do your own unit. But they would, for instance, in a geology unit, there would be um, the need uh, to develop a competency in identifying a range of minerals. And then there would be a box that would be a set of those minerals that they could study. 
and then there were sources that they could go to as guides to find out of uh, what the characteristics were of the different uh, minerals. And then there was a personal test at the end. Now they still had to finish and write the science test, but they were able to go through the packages uh, and, um, and uh, learn the unit on their own. And that's, that is more self-directed than the teacher standing in front and, uh, and speaking that content to everybody. And it provides opportunity for individuals to, to find their own best way to learn as well. Uh, so that, that's the kind of learning package, but it's not strictly uh, you know, self-directed as the way I described it earlier. Uh, the, the, the plan, the personal plan, uh, is when you set your own goal and describe a plan, well, we, we laid it out as a, um, uh, we call it an action plan. It started with a vision. What is your vision of what, it, what you hope to, uh, to achieve and to learn? What is it, it part of a larger uh, vision you have for your own development? Then what is your goal? Um, let me just give you the simple form of it. You know, what is your goal? What is your plan for achieving that goal? And then what would be, what would you um, be able to do? Uh, how will we be able, how will you and, and we as your uh, teachers be able to assess the quality of the performance you've had in this action? So they present three levels like, uh, you know, or passing ordinary. Uh, okay, uh, got it done kind of thing, and then I uh, did well, and then I was excellent. And, uh, and that, was the, that, was, uh, that was the teaching plan. The triads uh, are, you know, um, um, the idea of, of being self-directed isn't, uh, isn't everybody in a little corner by themselves. Um, uh, it is that we learn enormously from everybody, just like my art class that I just came back from, uh, that I'm taking uh, at a local university um, in, the, uh, in the studio arts. I'm a sculptor, and we all, you know, there are 16 of us, and we all have our individual projects. Some are metal, some are uh, clay, some are wood, so, you know, and so on. Some are stone, and everybody's working on their projects, all of them different, but we learn from each other. And uh, we're constantly talking to each other, and as well as working on our own. And we have a master sculptor there uh, commenting on our work and discussing it with us. And we have a tech to help us do it. So um, there's lots of, you know, we all need lots of uh, assistance. And we learn a lot from each other um, uh, along the way. And part of the success of being self-directed is knowing how to find the person who can give you the best help. So, uh, but we use triads as, like, as a sort of order. We could teach goal setting, for instance, uh, as a whole class. Then we go into small groups, into the into the support group, let's say, and and we each set um, we set a group goal. Uh, and as they say, what you learn to do in the group, you can then do uh, on your own. And then the th the third thing is having with that background, you then move to setting your own goals. Um, so uh, the triad is a, is a learning operation. It also means that when you're setting your proposals, they uh, are, uh, uh, they can listen to your um, proposals for your, your own actions, discuss it with you, ask you questions, help you to, to enrich it and develop it, um, and, uh, and provide you with support and assistance. Uh, and you become a team helping each other achieve your individual activities. Um, and that's very much a part of the self-directed world. Uh, the, so that's a triad. It's not necessarily a triad. It can be uh, partners. It can be, you know, up to four or five, but not too many so that everybody gets their time. Um, moving on to passages. Well, the passages are another name for uh, the activities that you, uh, in Jefferson County Open, uh, they were the ones who introduced the word passages, I believe. Uh, and um, they use it for grad in the graduation program where the students take on six uh, challenge activities. Um, I can't, I'm not sure I can remember them all now. It's been a while, but it's adventure, um, uh, business, work, uh, 
pers um, practical applications, uh, curiosity. Um, it, it, there, there are there are a full range of fields, and uh, the student has to plan an activity and demonstrate that it's a challenge. That is, that it moves them beyond the easy and familiar. Uh, it's kind of mythical in that sense. It's a hero's journey uh, for each individual because it requires courage. And in that courageous act of going, for instance, to a dig in Mexico, um, you have to be courageous to take that risk to step out of the easy and familiar. Uh, and you have to um, be confident that you will be able to handle yourself and um, be able to deal with the challenge of performing uh, in, in, in those activities. So uh, the passage then is what you do as your passage to adulthood. So you prove that you can go out and uh, in an adventure and climb a mountain, um, but of course, thousands of possibilities there. Um, uh, you can prove then, uh, and, and in doing those activities, you, you um, demonstrate your readiness for, uh, for graduation, your readiness to move on, not just from school, but to adulthood. Uh, the agreements. The agreements are like contracts you make with yourself, and it's the uh, it's the plan um, set in uh, uh, in a um, uh, in the form of a contract with yourself. Uh, and um, well, just a minute now, maybe you mean that the agreements, the agreements, um, the agreements that we make with ourselves. And those, um, remember Ruiz, the four agreements? There's also a set of agreements that, uh, that we make um, in pursuing self-direction, agreements with ourselves, that we will be honest because, you know, we are being honest with ourselves. That's the, that's the key, to be honest with yourself. Um, and another agreement, uh, for instance, is to take full responsibility. There is no one to blame. You are responsible for what happens in your life. And uh, so it's agreements of that nature that provide the style um, 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 that guide the student in pursuing the self-directed activity. Finally, the celebration. Hey, you know, uh, I've been to the celebration at uh, Jefferson County Open, and it's quite spectacular because the students have really been through something. They've, uh, um, I sat in on one, uh, a young girl had just gotten her pilot's license, and another guy had actually come from a dig in Mexico. Uh, another uh, group was celebrating, uh, the, the, oh, I'm just picking out one of the six, was celebrating um, the, they'd been down, uh, been a flood um, in a river near the, where they were, and they've been down helping a farmer dig out for two weeks and uh, things like that because service is a very important, one of the very important um, uh, passages. And the celebration is simply a recognition uh, of, um, of the importance of this transition that, you know, when they know that this, that they are not just graduating from school, they are moving from childhood to adulthood, and uh, that is charged with meaning. And it is the goal, um, if you like, that uh, that school has is to graduate people charging into life and charging into adulthood. So uh, this is a celebration, and there's speeches and music and dancing and um, action, uh, little you know dramatizations and that sort of thing. That uh, and it's a grand thing to be there and uh, see them all celebrating the things they've done because they know what the others have done and admire it and the grand feeling in this uh, in this environment. It's quite different from uh, uh, the celebration uh, that we usually see for graduation. I want to move to Q&A in a minute, but before I do so, I want to ask you about a line in the book that has kind of a shadow that goes over when I read this line. It, it was, 
Sometimes the dragon wins. Why does the dragon win sometimes? Well, sometimes you just set your goal too high. Sometimes um, you find out a harsh reality about yourself. Sometimes uh, people do rotten things to you. Um, and um, I, I mean, when I say sometimes the dragon wins, I mean sometimes things don't go your way. And you have to be able, you know, you have to have the, the sense of confidence to be able to stand strong in those moments of storm. There were several books that you referenced in the uh, in your book that I thought, oh, I want to go buy that book. And I discovered they were mostly out of print and they were very expensive. Is there is there something there? I mean, is is it is that telling us something that these really valuable works around self direction and learning aren't kind of aren't, aren't in current editions? Um, is is this still really a minority view? Well, I, I suspect it is, but uh, you have to recognize that uh, that everybody in school is going to be facing the challenge of uh, self-direction because uh, the modern technology is putting everything in the student's hand. And there's no question that if a student wants to, even do high school, I know I haven't checked this out exactly, but I know a number of universities provide high school courses and first-rate high school courses uh, and college. You can do college online. Um, and a lot of some schools will also um, provide you with um, uh, uh, you can get a degree online as well. I believe also that with what is coming in the future, um, and I'd even propose it, is that students become highly self-directed, that they uh, keep a, a journal, uh, which is like a, uh, a record of their thinking and development and ideas, and that they keep a portfolio that is a demonstration of all the work that they've achieved and that they start to think of it as a set of achievements that they are designing um, in order to um, uh, in order to, to represent themselves as the very best they can. I think it's a great way of thinking. I'm building this portfolio uh, and a journal to describe the steps I've taken, and um, I have these proofs of what I have accomplished as a result. Um, what more do we need in order to demonstrate that we have made great achievements? And what better motivation for doing them than assuming that we are building our lives and that our lives are public? So Margaret makes a comment that I think should be our first question. If you have a question for Maurice, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your virtual hand. That's the hand icon at the top of the participant window and I'll give you the microphone. But uh, Margaret says, we tried moderate oh, student-directed learning, but the students wanted the teachers to tell them. Wow. Did I lose you there? there? No, I, I, no, I'm just saying, um, I think that's, that's, that's a result. I, when I did my research and, and developed a, a self-directed classroom, like starting from nothing, uh, other students, said to me, one of the students said, well, what do you want me to do? Tell me and I'll do it. And I, I, I sat, and this is my conferencing, and I sat and talked with him for a long time. And uh, he had become very successful at finding out what the teacher wanted, giving the teacher exactly what they wanted, and doing well. And he didn't want to give that up. And I think that's quite common. Um, you know, if you've, if, you've, if you've nailed the system, why would you want to change? And, uh, and particularly when you knew that in the new system, you might not have the same success that you had uh, in, in, uh, uh, in this reliable, predictable way. So, I mean, I understand that. That's a, I think that's, that's quite human. Um, and uh, part of the process here is to encourage that, that student to start to see the importance of developing 
their own view, and it's what it's what life demands. Is they have to be able to think, what is it that's worth doing, uh, and what is it that's worth doing well, and how do you do that thing well, and can I keep going when the going gets tough to make sure I do it well? Uh, that's you know that that to me is the kind of of essence here. Is there a part of our uh, humanity? where we, there is a temptation to escape from freedom, where it's comfortable to have someone else telling us what to do? And do you think some people are uh, even sort of significantly built that way? Um, I think that's true, but I think also, like I go to lectures, I, I go to hear speakers and uh, go to movies that I think are going to be informative or helpful. Um, so I, I use all kinds of sources uh, for uh, for developing new, for finding about what's going on and, and generating new ideas myself. So I, I think that's quite reasonable. I think it's also comfortable. Listen, the main, the main thing that you fight when you start teaching self-direction is inertia. And it, it's also the first thing that the individual fights in becoming self-directed is their own inertia because Inertia is the natural state, and it takes energy, imagination, courage, diligence, and everything like that in order to move forward. Uh, one guy, I've forgotten his name now, uh, Preston or something like that, Prescott, wrote a book called um, The War of Art, and it's about the war we have with our own resistance to taking action. I think it, it exists. So yeah, it, it's it's comfortable to have the least responsibility possible, but um, I don't think it's a healthy state. We have probably time for one or maybe two questions. If you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your virtual hand. Uh, some time ago, Sandy asked a question in the chat that I wanted to make sure we got to. She said, what about students who have um, ADB or some other form of behavioral disorder. What could be more perfect than a self-directed program? Good short answer. <laughs> um, your book is geared toward the traditional school. Sorry, I talked over you. No, that's okay. Go ahead. I just wanted to say so, that I, I, I didn't mean to be uh, I didn't mean to be uh, ridiculously brief in that answer, and, uh, but the the elaboration is uh, quite extensive to, uh, to to cope with it. But the fact is that, in my view, um, um, the focus on the individual and the focus on the individual's development according to where they are now and moving them forward is exactly what such a person needs. Sandy wanted to clarify she meant uh, ODD, Oppositional Defiant Disorder. Uh, Mr. McConkie asks, I've just started with SDL. What is what is your number one piece of advice? What was that? Um, Someone has just started with student-directed learning. What's your number one piece of advice? Care about them to the utmost limit of your ability. I think that's a great place to stop. Uh, Maurice, thank you so much for coming on the show. As a courtesy, we do finish on time. This has been terrific. Well, I, I hope so. Uh, it's off the top of my head, and uh, uh, I, I hope it's been helpful. Uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you and, uh, and to your audience. Thank you so much. The book is the Self-Directed Learning Handbook. And then, am I right, it's selfdirectedlearner.com? Self-Directed Learning. Selfdirectedlearning.com. Self yeah. And, uh, and there's, there's a lot of stuff on that, on that website. Thanks, Maurice. Thanks, everybody, for attending. I will type in the chat in just a second, selfdirectedlearning.com. Really a pleasure to have you on the show. Take care, everybody. Good Thanks night or good day, depending on where you are. Thanks, Maurice. Bye for now.